Before we, be, before we give our time to Pete, um, I know we've been getting a lot of Bible uh, in the talk itself, but I thought I would read what Pete said was a, a really crucial passage for this next session uh, from Ephesians chapter 4. So if you'd open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read verse 7 down to verse 16. Ephesians 4, verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Father, help us as we've heard your word now, all, as we've heard your word this morning, and as we will continue to hear your word uh, in the hour ahead and throughout the rest of the day to continue to mature us as men and women, growing us up in the fullness of Christ so that we might reach the full stature of maturity which you've purposed for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter, we're looking forward to hearing you now, brother. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chase. Uh, thanks for coming back, uh, everyone. Uh, assuming that you did, I, I, all I'm seeing is a, is a camera, but I hope there's some people in the room uh, listening to this. Uh, well, in our first uh, talk, we uh, divided the one another commands into two, uh, love one another, speak to one another. We saw, though, that that's a slightly artificial uh, kind of division, and perhaps we should think of love one another as the umbrella and uh, operate with the division that we saw in Peter, speak to one another, serve uh, one another. Uh, but really, for the purposes of this talk, we just need to see that speaking one another is not something separate or different to loving one another, but it is a way in which we can love one another. Uh, so uh, the passage that Chase just read, Ephesians 4:15, uh, Paul commands the Ephesians to speak the truth in love, and that's a verse we'll come back to. So in this session, I want to uh, think about how we can love one another by speaking to one another. And I want to, at the beginning, acknowledge uh, the work of two people who've done um, so much more study on this topic than I have. Now, their books are PhDs, so they're kind of much more on the technical side, but they're uh, excellent, um, and uh, both in the library, the college library, uh, if uh, you want to read more. So Claire Smith uh, did her PhD on uh, Pauline communities as what she calls scholastic communities, uh, exploring the idea of the, the Pauline churches, at least, uh, being learning educational uh, communities. Now, Claire's focus is uh, broader than the, the one another speaking uh, language, but in, in examining the educational character of the Pauline uh, churches, she dealt with a lot of the vocabulary that we'll be looking at. It was very, very helpful. So it's in the library. I'd recommend it. Sorry, actually, it's not in the library. It's on my desk. It will be in the library as soon as uh, I get a chance to take it back. Uh, Tony Payne, uh, did his PhD um, on the one another speech in the New Testament. His PhD was called Truthing in Love. And uh, really for this talk, I was uh, very tempted to just read large slabs of text from uh, Tony's PhD. Um, and in fact, his PhD is one of the only PhDs to directly examine this question at uh, PhD level. Again, it, this is in the library, and uh, I would recommend it if you want to get into the, the, the details of uh, this issue. Uh, but the foundations of one another speech, the foundations of one another speech, we won't spend as long uh, on this as we did uh, in our first session, 
Uh, God is a speaking God. Uh, we see that uh, throughout uh, scripture. Uh, he spoke creation into being. He spoke in and through his son. And being made in the image of God means that uh, to be like God, we, we, we will speak. Uh, we will speak. Uh, we also saw in our first session, John 3, 34, he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For God gives the spirit without measure. The father loves the son. And has given all things into his hand. Uh, Very simply, love leads to speech. Uh, More fully, the love that the Father has for the Son is manifested in its fullest extent in the giving of the Spirit, which leads to the Son speaking the very words of God. When we love one another, we are participating in this love leading to speech prompted by the Spirit that the Father has for the Son. And throughout scripture, uh, there's not simply the idea of God's word being formally uh, proclaimed to a a multitude. Uh, Throughout the Bible, God's people are expected to speak to one another. It's part of how they relate it to one another. Uh, So Deuteronomy, uh, one another's speech is seen in the family relationship. Uh, Chapter 6, verse 6, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Uh, Proverbs is a book that's full of exhortation to wise, life-giving speech. For example, chapter 10, verse 20, the tongue of the righteous is choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Chapter 25, verse uh, 11, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. In contrast, the speech of the foolish is destructive. Chapter 11, verse 9, with his mouth, the godless man would destroy his neighbor, but by knowledge, the righteous are delivered. So this New Testament one another speech is an extension of this Proverbs wise, life-giving speech. It's also an extension of the Deuteronomy family speech. Uh, what we've seen is the idea of the family uh, is extended in the New Testament, that while the, the, what we might call the biological uh, family uh, remains vital, critical, the family defined by the DNA of the word of God, uh, that is also a, a vital entity too. Well, the importance of one another's speech is seen in how frequently it's referred to in the New Testament and the variety of ways that we are expected to speak to one another. And in one sense, this is not surprising. If speech is a fundamental part of love, and if kind of loving one another is the fundamental way that we're to relate to brothers and sisters, well, then you'd expect lots of language of uh, speaking to one another. And uh, when we look at the vocabulary, uh, we can see that there is what we might call a general speech. So there are kind of some commands that just talk in in general terms about how we speak uh, to one another. Uh, So we might uh, think of Ephesians 5, you know, address one another uh, in psalms and uh, hymns and spiritual songs. Uh, We pray for one another. We greet one another. We welcome one another. Uh, There are examples of one another's speech that don't use the one another construction. So older women are to teach what is good to and so to train uh, the young women to love their husbands and children. There's also what we might call negative one another speech. So we're not to lie to one another, Colossians 3, 9. We're not to speak evil against one another. And we're not to grumble against one another, uh, James 5, verse 9. Now, I just want to pause on this. I'm not going to spend uh, uh, a lot of time. It's not the focus of the talk. But it is striking how important it is that we avoid negative speech, not just that the sort of obviously to us sinful lying to one another, which is ruled out, but this kind of uh, negative uh, grumbling against one another. Uh, Grumbling seems to be the default way that we relate to those who are in leadership over us, whether towards our pastors, parish councils, other leaders in the churches. Uh, We Uh, We default to that rather than defaulting to what the New Testament holds out as what should be our default, which is that thankfulness. Rather than do that, we uh, uh, tend to to default to pointing out 
uh, what is wrong. Uh, this is what a friend um, uh, who's a minister said to me, uh, the majority of feedback a minister gets is silence or is negative. Uh, other people uh, often assume that others are saying thank you, but it's not the case. Uh, so the majority of feedback that this minister and other ministers I've talked to would say the same thing is either negative or silence. And yet scripture reminds us, uh, James um, uh, 5 verse 9, not to grumble against each other, whether it's leaders or it's uh, others uh, in, in the church. It just seems that critical speech, we're wired to speak critically, uh, whereas grace teaches us to speak in ways uh, that uh, build up. Uh, we're not going to spend uh, more time on that, but it is something that I, I thought is it's very important for us uh, to, to hear uh, God's word at that point. Uh, by far the most common uh, group of words uh, in the New Testament in terms of how we speak to one another would be what we might call exhortation. Um, so there's a, a couple of words that are variously translated as comfort one another, uh, encourage one another, exhort one another, stir one another up, admonish uh, one another. So there's exhortation. And there's at least one uh, example that we'll look at of uh, teaching uh, one another. So uh, it, in a few moments, we'll look at those kind of two broad ideas of exhorting one another and teaching one another. Uh, but before that, I want us to look at two passages which uh, give us a, a broader understanding of the importance of one another speech, uh, the importance of one another speech. Uh, so Ephesians 4 uh, that Chase uh, read earlier, I'm just going to read a few of the verses from verse 13. The goal is that we might attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried out by every carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, I just want to focus on a, a couple of aspects in that passage. Now, this passage itself does not use the one and other language, although Paul does uh, in uh, chapter 4, verse 25. But as we said, kind of verse 15 describes that one another speech uh, very powerfully, speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth in love. Now, in this context, in the context of, of Ephesians, the truth is more than simply, you know, the opposite of that which is false. Uh, back in chapter 1, verse 13, uh, Paul talks about the word of truth, the gospel. So I think speaking the truth in love is, is what we might call gospel at speech. And uh, again, I've been very helped by um, my uh, friend and colleague, Lionel Windsor, uh, who uh, has produced a, a series of blog posts going through the book of Ephesians uh, called Lifting Your Eyes. I, I would commend it to you. It's, it's one of the best things uh, written on Ephesians. And Lionel has just given it away uh, free on his website. Uh, absolutely um, uh, so helpful. And um, as Lionel points out, uh, you know, the, the Greek here, speak the truth in love, is actually uh, truthing in love. That's the, the title of, uh, of Tony Payne's PhD, truthing in love. And uh, this is what Lionel writes. Uh, Paul's not just telling us that we should say true things in general. Rather, he's saying that we should be speaking in a way that is constantly informed by the key truth that matters, the gospel. That, that's so helpful. That we should be speaking in a way that is constantly informed by the key truth that matters, the gospel. Truthing involves speaking the truth, speaking the gospel, speaking about the implications of the gospel, speaking in a gospel-shaped way. Uh, this, of course, will involve saying true things. It will also involve saying challenging things, but it means so much more. It means speech that flows from the gospel. So we speak the truth in love. We love one another by speaking this gospel-shaped, gospel-influenced speech to one another. 
And the, the critical thing that Ephesians 4 shows us is this is not a this is not a trivial thing. This is kind of not a sort of nice, uh, you know, cherry on, on the top. You know, oh, our church is doing super well because the people speak, um, you know, uh, this kind of gospel speech to one another. No, this is the essence of what, what church relationships are meant to be. And, and the effects are profound because you can see the negative in verse 14. This is, what, this is what it looks like when this gospel speech does not happen. Verse 14, so that we may no longer be uh, children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. This is what it looks like for a church that doesn't do this one another gospel speech. And we need to feel the force of the image. You know, children, young children are helpless. Uh, without people to care for them, they perish. Uh, but then think about young children on their own in the middle of the ocean. Uh, being buffeted by the wind and the waves. But then think of them on their own in the middle of the ocean, surrounded by crafty and cunning men who seek to destroy them. They're totally helpless and hopeless. And yet that's the church without this every member gospel speech. But as we do it, as we speak the truth to one another, we grow up to maturity. Verse 15, we grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Churches mature as each part is working properly, as each part is working properly. Uh, we thought about what a healthy family would look like in the last session and how it's a sign of immaturity. In a family, uh, you know, if someone just chooses to be uh, passive, well, a healthy family will involve everyone pulling their weight. A healthy church will be the same, loving and serving one another, as we saw in the last session. And here, specifically, speaking this gospel-shaped speech uh, to one another, encouraging, building up, praying, exhorting, speaking the truth in love. Without this kind of one another speech, our churches won't grow and will remain infants in Christ. It's striking how important Paul sees this kind of one another speech. It doesn't just matter uh, uh, what comes from the pulpit, and that, that does matter a lot. Uh, it's absolutely vital what comes from the, the, the pulpit, but if that is not being replicated, expanded, built upon, applied, well, then the church will be uh, truncated and impoverished. This kind of speech for Paul is not an optional extra. And what Paul is setting out here is uh, a, um, what we might call an eschatological vision of the church, a sort of end time, but this is the idea of what, what the church and its perfection uh, will look like. And we see that a, a few verses later in, in verse 25, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why? For you are members of one another. Again, you can see so many of the themes that we've been looking at coming together. We speak the truth to one another because we are members of one another. And again, Lionel is so helpful in showing the connection of this verse back to uh, Zechariah 8 and uh, Zechariah's kind of end time vision of what uh, uh, the, the true community of faith will look like. This is what Zechariah says in, in chapter 8, verse 16. These are the things that you shall do. You shall speak the truth to one another. You'll render in your gates judgments that are true and make for peace. Do not devise evil in your hearts against uh, other one another. And love no false oath, for these things I hate, declares the Lord. And uh, Paul concludes the section reflecting, reflecting on speech. Um, verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your minds. Again, that warning about corrupting talk, grumbling against one another. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only, only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Our one another speech matters. It's not an optional extra. By it, we build one another up. By it, we even give grace to those who hear what we say. Our words are powerful. Our words are powerful. I guess that this idea of speaking to one another, it just seems so ordinary. It seems mundane. It seems uh, trivial. You know, that there's very little theological debate 
uh, you know, about speaking to one another. And perhaps that's why we don't think about it. <clears throat> it's not controversial, but so often it's not happening in our churches. And this is a time in history when it's so easy to happen. You know, communication has never been uh, so easy. And yet so often, what do we choose? The wonderful means of communication, the electronic means of communication that the Lord has given us, we use it to, to, to nitpick, to pull down, to grumble, to complain. Whereas we could use this powerful, these powerful means of communication that the Lord has so graciously given us to unleash this kind of one another speech, to build one another up, to strengthen one another, even when we can't uh, uh, be with one another uh, face to face. Perhaps we feel overwhelmed. Well, why not start small? Uh, why don't you send an encouraging text message to someone today? I I'm praying for you. Or I, I was really struck by this verse in God's word uh, today. Or this aspect of the gospel uh, helped me uh, today. My family are in, in isolation. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a fun uh, experience. It's irritating. It's difficult. Uh, friends have been so wonderfully uh, supportive. Uh, a friend just texted me um, and said, you know, when we were in isolation, this verse really helped me. Psalm 46, verse 10, be still and know that I am God. And just that, that verse really that helped me, you know, as I was sort of agitated and angry and annoyed. Why do we have to be in this situation? Um, the, the, the word from a friend citing a Bible verse, you know, it, it, uh, it helped me. It helped me grow and, uh, and kind of reorientate myself. And you sort of multiply that by a thousand, ten thousand, a 10,000, 100,000. You know, there's, there is a real opportunity for, uh, for growth uh, as uh, Christian believers together. That's Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, if you want to turn uh, there, 1 Corinthians 14. And uh, I'll just read uh, the first five verses. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God, for no one uh, understands him but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Uh, what is uh, prophecy? Uh, I gave an elective uh, at the PNA a few years ago. The video is online. I, I basically argued that in this chapter, so prophecy is not the same uniformly across the Bible, let alone across the New Testament. In this chapter, prophecy, I think, is uh, what we might say a spirit prompted application of the gospel. In this chapter, I'm not saying this is prophecy everywhere, even in the New Testament, but in this chapter, prophecy is spirit-prompted application of the gospel. It's a form of one another speech. Interestingly, it's not spectacular speech. Sometimes, you know, we think of prophecy, we think it's, it's kind of impressive, oracular, spectacular speech. It doesn't have to be, and I don't think the Corinthians saw it that way because Paul has to exhort them to do it. They weren't drawn to prophecy. They were drawn to what they thought of as the more spectacular tongues. Prophecy just seems very ordinary speech uh, to them. Uh, one of the things that makes us nervous when we're thinking about prophecy and its relevance today is the language of revelation. And a couple of times, at least in this passage, Paul talks about prophecy in terms of revelation. Verse 26, uh, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation. Or verse 30, in the context of uh, people prophesying, if a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first uh, be silent. And so if prophecy is revelation, well, then how can it not compete with scripture and call the doctrine of the sufficiency of scripture into uh, question? I mean, that, that's, a very, uh, that's a very important thing to, to think about. And I realize I'm not gonna be able to go into uh, all the detail in this uh, talk, but it's just worth noting that Paul uses the language of revelation in two different ways. There is that kind of authoritative epochal idea of kind of revelation in the gospel in Christ. But he can also use the same uh, reveal word in a different context. So Philippians 3 verse 15, he's uh, kind of commending an understanding to the, to the Philippians. And he says, let those of us who are mature 
think this way. But if in anything you think differently or otherwise, God will reveal that to you. So revelation in that context doesn't mean the sort of scriptural authoritative revelation. It seems to mean something like an insight. God will give you insight. I think that's how the NIV translates. God will give you insight. So we rightly distinguish in our kind of systematic theology between the doctrines of revelation in Christ, scripture, the gospel, and the doctrine of illumination, where the spirit sort of enables us to grasp uh, these things. But that distinction, which is a right and proper distinction, doesn't always line up with the language that the New Testament uses. And that language of uh, reveal can be used of uh, both uh, phenomena. So that's why I think we can be comfortable, uh, even though Paul's using this language of, of reveal, that he means something like it's, it's an insight. It, it's an insight that the Spirit uh, gives us. It, it's an application of the gospel, Spirit-prompted application of the gospel. In any case, in this chapter, prophecy, uh, where they were speaking to one another, has the same effects as the speech we just looked at in Ephesians 4. It builds up the church. Again, the purpose of one another speech, whether it's uh, speaking the gospel in Ephesians 4 or whether it's this uh, one another speech in the form of prophecy, is to build one another up. The way that uh, prophecy has been understood by um, many of our charismatic brothers and sisters, often I think in unhelpful ways, makes us nervous about this chapter. But I think that this is simply just a type of one another speech. And Paul cannot stress more strongly how important that is for the building up of the church. So verse 12, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. I think if you, if you only take one thing from today, you know, maybe you've just kind of jolted awake. Uh, the one thing to take from, verse, from today is verse 12. Strive to excel in building up the church. Uh, this is all our responsibility. Paul at this point is not just addressing the, the pastor and the elders of the church at, at Corinth. No, he's telling all of them to strive to excel in building up the church. All of us, that's what we're meant to do, to strive to excel, to build up the church. And, and we do it as we speak God's truth to one another. Uh, think about your church. Uh, think about the things that frustrate you about your church. And think about the things that you have done to strive, to make an effort to build up the people in your church. I imagine it's much easier to think about the things that frustrate us about our church than it is to think about all the things that we have done to strive to build up the people in our church. Uh, this word in, in uh, chapter 14 is a word for both men and women. The beginning of uh, chapter 11 assumes that, that women will uh, prophesy in the church. We'll think in a few moments about what that might look like, uh, this kind of one another speech in a congregational uh, setting. I'm not saying, we, you know, 1 Corinthians 14 is, is necessarily free of kind of questions or, or complexities. But the basic point is we've seen with Ephesians 4, one another edifying speech, speech that seeks to build up the church, is something every Christian uh, can and is uh, to engage in. And it's not a secondary nice extra, as if the real ministry is done from the front. Now, again, if we read these passages carefully, we cannot help but feel the force of what Paul is saying as to how important this kind of speech is. So with yourselves, strive to excel in building up the church. Uh, so let's just think, though, of uh, the different forms of one another speech. We've seen there's a variety of, of one another speech language, but I want to focus on those two ideas of exhortation and uh, teaching. And what we'll see is, particularly in Paul's letters, uh, there's a parallel between Paul's speech and the speech of those in his churches. And uh, you see that in Colossians very clearly. Colossians 1 verse 28, Paul reflects on his his and his colleagues at ministry about Christ. At Christ we proclaim warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. 
Uh, later on in the letter, he calls them, chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts uh, to God. Now, the parallels aren't exact. He doesn't tell them to proclaim the word to one another. Uh, but just as he warns or exhorts and teaches, they are to teach and admonish one another. Now, we'll come back to Colossians 3.16 in a moment, but I just want to think about this idea of exhortation uh, more generally. So, uh, you know, the underlying uh, Greek word is variously translated across the New Testament as comfort, encourage, exhort, appeal, urge. Uh, the language is used in Hebrews, uh, probably the most uh, famous examples of the one another commands. When you think of, you know, the one another commands, you think of uh, Hebrews, exhort one another uh, every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, don't neglect to meet together, but encourage one another. That same word. Uh, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Uh, as we saw in Colossians, uh, we see the same dynamic in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, that what Paul does in his speech, he expects them to do. But what 1 Thessalonians is really helpful in showing us is that there's an even tighter connection between uh, what uh, the words that um, they, as, as one another, are, are to speak and how they are based on the words that Paul has already spoken to them. In other words, they're to speak his words uh, to one another. So chapter 2, verse 11 uh, you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you. Uh, different words, but kind of same sort of overlap in, in meaning. Charge you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you in his own kingdom and glory. And then chapter 4, verse 18, what are they to do? They're to encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Uh, chapter 5, uh, we see something uh, similar. Chapter 5, verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now, this is a, a, a doubly fascinating passage because, again, it shows us the ministry of church members to, to one another is to mirror Paul's ministry. But in the middle, Paul also speaks of those who are over them and admonish them. So what we see is Paul, that the leaders of the church and the church members all doing the same. They're all engaging in the same type of speech as they warn and exert, uh, exhort and encourage uh, one another. And in each case, the exhortation that believers are to engage in with one another is based on the teaching or the commands of Paul. Uh, so chapter 4, verse 18, they're to encourage one another with these words, the words that he's just written. In chapter 5, they're to encourage one another in light of the coming day of the Lord that he has just spoken about. Uh, so Claire Smith, in her book, really helpfully de defines this activity as a persuasive appeal in the context of existing relationships to accept and implement the scriptural content, whether that took the form of admonishment, exhortation, summons, or comfort. Uh, what that means is, is exhortation and encouragement, it, it's not just general sort of, you know, keep going, you're doing great. It, it's, it's much more closely tied to the gospel. That's what we're seeing. We saw it in Ephesians 4. We're seeing it in 1 Thessalonians, that the encouragement and exhortation um, has this tight connection uh, to the gospel. It's an encouragement to live out the gospel. It's an encouragement to live out the gospel. Uh, what about uh, teaching? Uh, the dominant word in the, in the New Testament that believers are to do to one another is to exhort one another. Um, but the language of teaching is also present. And uh, let's look at uh, Colossians 3.16. And I've uh, laid the verse out in the outline in kind of three possible ways of understanding the relationship uh, between the different parts of uh, the verse. And uh, you can kind of dig into the commentaries and they'll um, uh, kind of explain this uh, helpfully. Uh, the issue really is, is, do we teach one another with Psalms and hymns 
and spiritual songs. And you can see that's the difference really between uh, option one and then options two and three. So option one, we sort of teach and admonish one another and we sing the psalm or options two and, and three, we teach one another with uh, this, the psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I, I, I don't want to sort of make this into this massive uh, kind of uh, exegetical debate. It's, it's not, but most commentators kind of opt for option two or three. Uh, so they see that we teach and admonish one another, in this verse at least, with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And you know, there are a few reasons for, for taking that reading. Um, Ephesians 5.19 being a parallel um, where you know, the, 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 uh, the songs actually go with the teaching. Okay. So what we see then is, is a general tre trend. It's a general trend. I'm not making an absolute uh, claim here. But that the, the teaching and the exhorting is taking existing content, uh, whether it's uh, songs, teaching from the apostle, uh, the truth of the gospel, and speaking that to one another. So we're speaking uh, the gospel to one another. We're speaking content to one another. We're speaking Christian songs uh, to one another. We're encouraging one another with uh, gospel content. In one sense, that just makes the whole thing so much easier. It's not that we have to sort of make up uh, what, what we're going to say. We can just, in a, in a sensitive way, quote the Bible to one another, um, you know, draw the, the, the you know, gospel implications. In other words, we're not having to be uh, creatively imaginative necessarily. Uh, we can just speak the truth of the gospel, of, of Paul's teaching uh, to uh, one another, of, of uh, Christian songs or psalms. Okay, well, we're up to the point, uh, one another's speech and formal congregational teaching and preaching. And I just want to drill down to the, to the question, uh, the particular question um, that might be at the back of some of our minds. How do we understand the relationship between the restriction that Paul lays down in 1 Timothy 2, I do not permit a woman to teach or ex exercise authority over a man, and this one another speech, for instance, that we saw in Colossians 3.16, teach one another. Uh, does that, holding those two, two together, does that mean that only men should teach uh, other men? No, I don't think so. I think context is crucial. 1 Timothy 2 verse 12 obviously establishes parameters for the Christian gathering, namely that women should not teach in a gathered uh, congregation. Women can and do teach and preach uh, to, uh, to other women. But this, uh, this prohibition against uh, women teaching men from 1 Timothy 2 is not an absolute prohibition in the sense that it rules out women uh, women teaching men in any and every circumstance. So here's an example that someone, um, or an illustration that someone gave me that I find very helpful. At Moore College, uh, you cannot teach unless you have a qualification in theology. What does that mean? Essentially, you cannot teach a course at Moore College unless you have a relevant qualification. Now, you might not agree with that, but we're recognized as a university college by the government. And so that's a standard that we have to, to keep to. Uh, does that mean that if two students sit down together at lunch, uh, one can't help the other understand the scripture better? Or if a faculty member sits down with a student, they can't learn something from the student, that if that did happen, the regulators would, would, would step in and you know, we'd, we'd, uh, we'd get uh, fined or, or shut down? Uh, not at all. Not at all. The context is key. Uh, delivering a course of lectures is one thing, chatting together at lunch is another. And interestingly and importantly, at, at college, we see those lunchtime conversations as not trivial, but is actually uh, absolutely vital. They're not a nice extra, but they're really at the heart of what we understand is learning together in community. So I think that helps us as we think about men and women teaching one another. There are restrictions. There are restrictions laid down in 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 11. We need to think about those. But there are also texts like the ones that we've just looked at that show that the New Testament expects all of us, men and women, to be teaching and encouraging and admonishing one another. So I think that critiques a type of interpretation that is so nervous and understandably wants to see 1 Timothy 2.12 correctly applied, that it extends it to every sphere and suggests that a woman should never teach a man in any or any, uh, you know, in any and every circumstance. That there's almost like a wariness from when that they men that they be influenced in any kind of spiritual way by a woman. 
I think that's an overreach of 1 Timothy 2 verse 12. And I think it goes against these one another texts that we've seen. I think scripture gives us freedom in this area. It creates an expectation of church as family, where as brothers and sisters, we love one another by speaking to one another, by teaching, rebuking, and encouraging uh, one another. Uh, it's you know just a very simple example. Just I was thinking uh, as I was preparing this talk, how it helped I've been. Conversations with Jane, uh, Claire Smith's PhD, Karen Job's uh, One Peter Commentary. I learned from them. They taught me uh, in this kind of one another sense uh, and, and uh, really helped and equipped me. It is striking uh, as in preparation, I, I um, had a look at a, a couple of um, websites of, kind of egalitarian movements who uh, very much want to see an, you know, an absolute um, identity in the ministries of um, uh, men and women. And there were lots of articles on what we might recognize as the more controversial uh, texts, but there were no articles that I could find. And I only did a quick search, but if they were, they were not very prominent on these kind of one another texts. And it seems that their understanding is it's only the sort of Sunday or the, you know, the, the pulpit preaching ministry to the, to the mixed congregation. That is significant. And though so somehow to deny that to, to women is to deny that them the opportunity to engage in significant ministry, which is simply not true. It's not what we see in the New Testament, which sees this one another ministry as absolutely vital. Uh, very helpfully, Tony Payne at one point in his PhD says this, uh, the challenge for Christian communities is to resist the tendency of congregational teaching and preaching to colonize all the available space in the practice of congregational word ministry. Uh, we need an enlarged vision in which the central place, absolutely the central place of congregational teaching and preaching is maintained, but in which other types of spirit enabled gospel centered speech are given their proper emphasis. Both congregational teaching and preaching and one another edifying speech are integral to the healthy functioning of Christian communities. Well, let's think about one another speech in practice. Uh, how can we ensure that this kind of rich, diverse one another speech happens in our contexts? Um, I think what we think sort of corporately and then individually, and I'm gonna give some suggestions, but I think the most important thing is that we think. We think as individuals, we think as, uh, speech, as, uh, as churches. Uh, we think carefully about our own context, the size of our church, the maturity, what would work best in our situation. I think the very dynamic personal nature of one another speech means that it will look different in different contexts. So I'm not laying down a sort of, these are the, you know, the five things that you need to do uh, in your church. Uh, but let's think about that congregational uh, service uh, level. Is there a place for one another speech in a main service? Jane's given us um, a few uh, suggestions, helpful suggestions already. We've seen the example of, of Lucy very helpfully sharing her testimony. I've been a, a member of two different churches uh, that I thought did one another speech uh, very well. Uh, one had a, a, a more formal morning service uh, that would look like the service that most of our churches um, that, you know, we're familiar with. The evening service was more informal though. There was still um, sermon, prayer, Bible reading, singing, but there was also a spot in the service when members of the congregation were encouraged to, to share the things that the Lord had taught them that week. Now, if you're, you're a rector, you might be getting a little bit nervous at, at that, but I don't remember it ever being awkward or anyone saying anything helpful. If they had, you know, the, the pastor would have stepped in and gently corrected uh, the person. Uh, the other church I went to uh, would incorporate input from a variety of people uh, in uh, their service. And <clears throat> it was a different context, very different context, different part of the world. And it did help that the service would normally last for three hours. Uh, and in that time, there was plenty of time uh, for people to testify, to ask uh, for prayer. And, and, you know, you might think that that could never happen here. You might hope that would never happen here. Maybe, maybe you're right. I'm not saying our services should be three hours long. I'm not even saying we should have different morning or evening services. I'm just asking us to at least think, thought, you know, be thoughtful, be considerate in how might uh, we be more creative uh, that we could include some of this one another uh, speech into our Sunday gatherings. Or you might think in the context of our church, where we are, the maturity, 
that um, we'll do that in, in other contexts. We're not gonna do it in, in uh, the main uh, service. I guess just being thoughtful as we seek to apply uh, this uh, New Testament teaching. Uh, what about our small groups? I guess the place where we see this most obviously happening is in our small groups. And again, I'm not going to lay down a manifesto for how we run our small groups. I'm just going to ask that we think more carefully about what we're actually doing in our small groups. Uh, last year, a church leader in New Zealand uh, tweeted this about uh, small groups. He said, though well-intentioned, I think small groups are often the most overrated unaccountable and ineffective ministries of the Western church. Now, maybe that's a little bit harsh, but it does make us stop and think, uh, what are we actually trying to achieve in our small groups? Sometimes we aren't exactly sure. We just have small groups because every church in our sort of constituency has small groups, or we've always had uh, small groups. Uh, sometimes our aims are just very general, you know, oh, small groups just where Christians can get together and encourage one another. I imagine in many of our contexts, um, our small groups are an extension of the teaching ministry of the church. So the focus is a detailed study of a particular passage, maybe a different passage, or maybe the passage that was preached on or is about to be preached on. And again, I'm not standing here today saying that we should abandon that. I just think it's, it's worth thinking about alternatives. So here's an alternative from uh, church history, uh, the early uh, Methodist class and band meetings. So John Wesley, in the early days of Methodism, uh, uh, established what he called class meetings. And the class meeting was a small informal service during the week. You can think of it, I guess, similar to the informal evening service that I described earlier. Uh, here's how uh, John Michael Henderson, John Michael Henderson's written a book on uh, Wesley's class meetings. This is how he describes it. Uh, the form format of the class meeting began with a short hymn, followed by the leader stating the condition of his own spiritual life. Uh, the leader would then give a short testimonial concerning the previous week's experience, thanking God for progress and honestly sharing any failures, sins, temptations, griefs, or inner battles. In this sense, the leader was modeling the role for the others to follow. Uh, by following this example, the tenor of the session was controlled and directed. Many of the participants were um, uh, Don, this is Henderson's words, downtrodden peasants uh, who had been unaccustomed to any expression of their inner feelings and personal experience. So that pace uh, established by the leader was a crucial step in the process. The subject matter of the class meeting was personal experience. Uh, the only place where well, you know, teaching conceptual data in, impinged upon the class uh, was the struggle which individuals underwent in internalizing or applying some biblical idea into their lives. The collective goal towards the class is pulled was the attainment of personal holiness or what Wesley called perfect love or the character of Christ. As new converts took up these goals for themselves, they were nurtured in the encouraging context of an affirming group, all of whom were in various stages of the same group. So that's the class that's a bigger group. There were smaller groups called bands. Unlike the class meeting, the band was a homogenous grouping by gender, age, and marital status. Now, bands were groups of five to six people who professed a clear Christian faith. So they were mature Christians, clear Christian faith, and who desired to grow in love, holiness, and purity of intention. Bands included ruthless honesty and frank openness. Members sought to improve their attitudes, emotions, feelings, intentions, and affections. A central function of the band was what Wesley called uh, close conversation. Uh, by this term, he meant soul-searching examination, not so much of behavior and ideas, but of motive and heartfelt impressions. Uh, Wesley himself said, the design of our meeting is to obey that, that command of God, James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another that you may be healed. Uh, like the class meeting in this smaller meeting, each person spoke in turn, the difference was that the level of maturity of the participants, the depth of their openness, and the readiness with which they spoke their feelings. In the class meeting, the responsibility was focused on the leader who was appointed to a pastoral role and who quizzed each member in turn. But in the band meeting, the members took individual initiative to speak their progress toward inward holiness, the leader only serving to start uh, the process. Uh, it's interesting, uh, Ray Ortland has um, 
uh, released a, a book on uh, pornography, kind of confronting, overcoming uh, pornography. And in that book, he talks about how we, we will often have what we call accountability groups. And he says that's not quite right from the, from the Bible. Rather, we should have sort of confession groups. And it's drawn from this, this idea from James 5.16, confessing our sins uh, to one another. Now, Wesley's groups were, were, were criticized. They were criticized as being inward looking and introspective. Uh, even some of his closest friends questioned their use and his enemies sort of used it as evidence that really he was reviving kind of the Roman Catholic idea of uh, confession. So again, I'm not calling for a radical overhaul of our small groups. I'm not standing here calling that, you know, our groups should turn into Wesleyan classes or bands. I'm just asking that we consider, you know, what of the variety of different speech uh, in the New Testament, including confessing our sins to one another, you know, in what context is that happening? In what context are we encouraging that to happen? And what is the best use of our small groups? Is it to concentrate on actively studying God's word? Or could that be better achieved by what you see in a lot of American churches where they have uh, something like an adult Sunday school class before the, the, the main that service where they, they really dig into God's word and work at it together. Uh, could small groups, it, you know, if that was done on the Sunday morning, could small groups be much more focused on the, the kind of exhortation and encouragement of, of Christian uh, growth? It, it, it's, it's not one or the other, it's, it's you know, it's both and. Uh, so that the breadth of the one and other commands uh, are reflected in the life of the church. You know, so smaller groups in, in, in our church context might be better suited to focus on living uh, the Christian life rather than working through a particular passage in detail, which is very important and would happen in another uh, context. Or perhaps your church context means that small groups really with the, the biblical literacy where it is that you know, your small groups do need to be uh, much more um, you know, an extension of uh, the teaching uh, ministry. I guess all I'm saying is that we be intentional and thoughtful about what we're using our small groups uh, for. To think about whether this variety of one another's speech could be more prominent in the life of our church and whether our small groups could be an intentional part of uh, meeting that. Uh, of course, this one another speech doesn't have to happen in uh, formal settings, uh, whether it's the congregation or the small group. Perhaps the most powerful application uh, might be uh, the personal conversations uh, that we have with one another. And this kind of speech is, it's so easy, really, when you think about it, and yet it's so powerful. Uh, the, the, the text message, the telephone call, uh, the, the encouraging walk. Uh, there are so many easy ways that we can do it, and it is so powerful. Here's Tony uh, Payne again, another uh, slab from his PhD. Uh, it can occur in personal conversation or in written form. It can arise spontaneously in response to circumstances or be more planned or proactive. It can begin with the biblical word and explore its implications for our lives or start with the need of the moment and draw on biblical Christocentric truth to address it. It could be a single encounter or an ongoing pattern of speech over time. It can occur between two individuals or within a small uh, informal gathering. Uh, the kind of speech, I guess, requires a, a, an openness, though, and a willingness to be uh, rebuked and critiqued. Uh, which, you know, whatever the faults uh, and, and extremes might have been, you know, in early Methodism, we see that sort of uh, openness and willingness for, for someone else to speak into uh, your uh, life. Uh, I was thinking about how uh, the quiet time is, uh, is a wonderfully helpful kind of established evangelical practice. And uh, maybe we could just make it a sort of a daily uh, uh, speaking to one another time. That, that would be another evangelical practice uh, we could do. Who have I spoken to today? Who have I sent a message to today? Who have I sought to encourage uh, today? And, and it doesn't always have to be earth shattering. Again, think of, think of the sermons that you have heard. I, I imagine that you could sort of, maybe there's a handful of, of sermons over the years, if you've been a Christian for a while, that were really kind of seminal and critical and life-changing. But most the sermons that you hear are just, they're sustaining. They're, they're good they, they, they feed you, they cause you to grow, but you don't necessarily remember them. And that's, you know, the same that we should expect with our conversations with one another. We, we don't have to sort of see these kind of conversations being memorable, life-changing conversations. So we're just drip feeding each other the gospel so that we keep going um, to uh, uh, the new creation uh, together. Uh, so uh, by way of conclusion, uh, before we have um, 
some questions. Uh, I guess the main thing that I want us to take away this morning is the significance of the one another commands. Uh, that we might need to reframe how we think about the significance of what we are doing. Uh, this kind of one another, uh, loving one another, speaking to one another seems inconsequential in the world's eyes. Uh, but we are, as we speak to one another, we are applying the gospel to one another, God's word to one another. We're seeking it to, 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 to see it take root in each other's lives. It's, it's an expression of who we are, born again by this word. So it should be the most natural thing in the world to speak this word to one another. The health of our churches depends critically on uh, the, the, the preaching from the pulpit. Not, not, nothing that I've said this morning should undermine the critical position of good um, biblical gospel preaching from our pulpits. But if that's not translating into love for one another, well, it raises questions. If it's not translating into uh, churches where we are anxious for one another, where we have an earnest, sincere uh, desire to, to love one another by serving one another, by speaking to one another, in a world where Jesus tells us that many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and a world that is heading to the return of the Lord Jesus and that terrible time when people will slay one another, more than ever we need to hear the words of Hebrews 3.13, to exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of us may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, and that all of us would strive to excel in building up the church. Why don't I pray, and then we'll have uh, some time for questions. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the riches of your words. Uh, we thank you for um, uh, the things that we have seen in your word uh, this morning. Uh, we do pray that you would help us uh, to love one another uh, earnestly from the heart. Uh, we pray that you would help all of us to increase in our sense of concern and responsibility for the others that you have placed us in fellowship with. Uh, we pray that you would help us all to grow in this, uh, in this call to speak uh, the gospel uh, to one another. And we pray that we would grow together in maturity uh, into Christ and that he might be glorified. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Peter, thank you very much for what you've said to us today. We're very grateful and looking forward to hearing from you now in a, a Q&A session. Uh, I'm going to be reading uh, some questions aloud for Peter to respond to, and uh, hopefully he's hearing me all right. You hearing me okay, Peter? Yeah, I'm hearing you fine. Thanks, Chase. Great to hear. Um, a few questions have been directed specifically to Jane, and we might ask Jane a few questions a little bit later. I'll save a few for you towards the end, Jane, if that's okay. Peter, the first comes from James Chen, and he asks, what examples of unnecessary restrictions have you seen others put in place regarding how men and women are to love one another as brothers and sisters? Yeah, I think um, that's a great uh, question, uh, James. Um, Lovely to hear from you. I think this nervousness, understandable and right nervousness to take 1 Timothy 2, uh, 2 12 seriously uh, in, in a world where that verse is kind of so often, I think, mis, um, misunderstood, misapplied. And so, um, you know, a, a desire to, to sort of fence that around. And, and so, um, you know, almost... Um, people thinking about how, as a man, I should read a Christian book written by a, a woman and, you know, that I should be careful that it doesn't, um, you know, break 1 Timothy 2.12 words. I, I just don't, don't see that as a, as, a, as a problem because 1 Timothy 2.12, I think, is just it's talking about the gathered congregation. And so, um, you know, in personal conversation, yeah, I let myself be influenced by, corrected by, instructed by uh, a woman. Certainly, you know, Claire... Um, Smith's uh, book on these uh, is issues just so much more um, detailed than anything that I, than I've any study I've been able to do, and you know she, she's she's an expert on, it. and I, you're totally comfortable with that. You know some 
in some contexts, I've seen some men be a, a little bit nervous with that idea. Yeah. Just on a similar line then, Peter, if you don't mind, um, getting clearer about uh, 1 Timothy 2, is the distinction for teaching between formal and informal contexts? Or, or, think, or can we be a bit more clear about, uh, you know, how men can learn from women? Is it only informally is the question? Um, I think 1 Timothy 2 is, is, you know, in the context of the gathered congregation. You know, that, that's, that's what Paul is talking about. Um, so, you know, th this is a whole, whole other topic, a whole other kind of p and um, set of talks for someone in the future. Um, so I'm not sure formal, informally, you know, we, it's, it's in the context of the, the gathering. That, that, I think, is what, what 1 Timothy 2 is, uh, is talking about. So, you know, I, I, learn from, I learn things from women in all sorts of contexts, spiritually and otherwise. Just, you know, the church that I go to holds to um, a view of 1 Timothy 2 where, you know, it's not appropriate for a, for a woman to, to, to teach and preach in a gathered congregation. I, I realize I'm opening up lots of, of questions here, which maybe are, are taking us a little bit away from uh, the main thing. I think it's just appropriate in terms of the context um, outside of that gathering that we can learn definitely from, uh, from one another as men and women. Thank you. Jane, you were saying something to me. Sorry. Jane's going to jump up here. We, um, we, we already have um, two really good talks, um, one by Dan Wu and also one by Lionel Windsor on the PNA website. And um, so Dan looks at um, different things that women do up front um, besides the, the Sunday sermon. And Lionel Windsor's the exact um, title just escapes him now, but the relationship between, is it teaching and congregational leadership? Um, and so both of them touch on this topic. Um, so if you've got um, questions about that, like is there appropriate teaching that a woman can do up front, besides the Sunday sermon, say like for example, in the slots that I suggested, um, yeah, you may wanna listen to their talks. Lionel, did you wanna say anything extra to that? No, and I can't- It's already been said. I can't see where Dan is, but yeah. Oh, he's up the back. Yeah. You, you have nothing to add? Or have you got nothing to add? Do you have anything to add? <laughs> he's got nothing to add. We don't have time. I'm just giving a long pause in case there's anything you want to fill in, Dan. This is good. All right. Um, next question for you, Peter. Uh, our after-church conversations always seem to be about the trivial, not the kind of speech that you've been talking about. Is there a way that we can help change this in our church culture? Um, yeah, I was thinking about that. A couple of things, I think, is not simply seeing the after-church conversation as the only time that we can do this one another speech. And so then you don't stress if, after a particular service, you do talk about something more uh, trivial. Uh, but yeah, to, to listen, all of us to listen to uh, the sermon more intently and not just, you know, think about, um, you know, how does this apply to me as an individual, but how can I encourage others? Um, and when I get opportunities to speak to them, and that might be uh, straight after the sermon. So I think it's a mind shift. I think we're very... Um, we, we tend to think of ourselves as individuals relating to God, but it, it, again, you know, if I'm striving to excel, to build up the church, as I listen to the sermon, I'm going to be thinking, oh, if I get a chance to um, talk to X after the service, I know that they model this really well. I'm going to ask them, you know, how, how they do this in their life. So it's just being intentional. intentional. Just with that, Peter, I mean, it seems as though some people are, are nervous about being overzealous maybe as yeah. well. So how do we actually get over that? Yeah, I think um, I think in our context, that's probably not a problem that we we face too much. Being overzealous. Okay, I'm, I've just been told as well that Simon and Margie's elective uh, today is going to be on on this very subject matter for those that have already signed up for it, and if you haven't, it'll be available later on on the website, so you can learn up then too. That's good. Thank you. Um, moving on then, this comes from uh, Lionel Windsor, or whether or not it's the real Lionel Windsor, I don't know, but it's there. <laughs> Lionel, 
or Lionel asks, um, as we encourage Christians who have become too comfortable with online church to return to -to face-to-face fellowship, how can the insights that you've shared help? Yeah, that's a really helpful, um, helpful question. And I think just my observation of my own self, my own family is that online church makes you passive. You're a consumer. And, um, you know, I think just encouraging um, all of us as we live the Christian life, that it's meant to be um, a life of, of speaking to one another, engaging with one another, loving one another. And it's it's not impossible, you know, we, we can't communicate electronically. It's much harder to do that if we're not meeting face to face. So again, that's just something we should raise, raise the profile of, because you're absolutely right, Lionel, that it's something that we can easily fall into. We've been conditioned, perhaps by a lot of time online, conditioned to think of church as kind of passive entertainment. And we've got to snap out of that as we sort of come back to more normal church. Yeah. Yep. Another question here, Peter, is whether or not these one another commands prioritize brothers and sisters in Christ over and above those outside of the household. Um, I think they do prioritize. I think there is a priority of how we relate to um, one another as uh, Christians. You know, it's not as if we don't want to be loving those outside of the the church. You know, uh, Galatians uh, you know, talks about, um, you know, <clears throat> doing good to all, especially to the household of faith. Um, so I, I think there should be a priority. And, you know, as our Christian communities are strengthened and, you know, strengthened in love, you know, as people uh, come and hear the gospel and interact with us, um, you know, we, we, we can love them. But I think, yeah, the New Testament very clearly, the priority is is loving one another. Yep. I just read that question again, Peter, and um, I I also see another way of reading it, and maybe I'll have you answer it the other way, just in case this is what they were intending. Does it extend to brothers and sisters outside of our own households? Is is there a priority on the congregation itself over against our own families? Over and against our family. So I, I guess you'd go, you know, family, you know, church, uh, you know, other Christians. Um, you know, obviously there are some very strong commands about loving your family. You know, if you, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever, Paul says in 1 Timothy, you know, it's very strong. Um, these one another commands, I think they're written to churches. Their understanding is they'll be applied uh, to churches. But for example, at least in one place that we looked at, 1 Peter 4, um, I think has the wider sort of Christian community uh, in mind. So. Yeah, so not wanting to rule out, um, you know, the, those kind of other tiers, but that, that, I guess that's the sort of priority that you would give it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a question from Richard. Uh, does the New Testament speak into how gender influences how we love each other? In other words, in these one another commands, are there, are there many that have uh, gender-specific directions for us? Yeah, not, not the one another commands as such. Obviously, um, <clears throat> slightly different context, but, you know, when Paul writes to Timothy, you know, he tells him how to relate to the older men in his church and the, the younger men and the younger women. You know, the younger women, he's to re- relate to them as sisters with absolute purity. So, you know, that's not exactly what we've been looking at, but I think you could take that principle and, uh, and apply it that, you know, as we, you know, as men and women, seek to love one another, it's in the context of as brothers and sisters in absolute purity. And, you know, we can work out the details of what that sort of means is wise and is unwise in the the context. Yeah. That's great. And and another question from uh, Richard here. Have you noticed um, Australian Christian men having a subconscious bias against receiving wisdom or informal teaching from women? And how does this show itself? Yeah, that's a very, very helpful question. I think I've lived in Australia now kind of 18 years. So maybe I'm just like the, you know, the the frog that's been boiled in the water. I I don't necessarily, um, uh, I I can't necessarily speak. I I think it's probably at the risk of falling into stereotypes, perhaps men are more, you know, more tend to 
functional conversations, functional relationships, rather than uh, those sort of more serious heart level conversations, not making absolute tendencies. I think that's true in Australia, it's probably true um, elsewhere as well. If yeah. that's true, if that's true, Peter, I mean, what, what is one way maybe we could take a step as men towards listening yeah, to women informally better? I think like, like Lionel's question earlier, it's just, just being intentional, recognizing it. Um, you know, <clears throat> in, in Titus, Paul tells Titus to, to rebuke uh, <clears throat> those who sin. And, you know, Paul's writing to a Christian leader and saying rebuke. As we read that, we, we, we need to recognize that there is a context where we might be rebuked. In, in a similar way, talking about all of this, it's not just about me encouraging other, others. It's also, I've got to be ready to, to receive encouragement, to, 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 to be thankful for it, to see what it is, whether or not it's kind of executed exactly the way that I would want, but to see that it is an expression of this kind of uh, uh, love that we're seeing in these, um, uh, in these verses. Uh, and maybe even inviting it, I guess, at points too yeah. would be helpful. Yeah, that's yeah. helpful. We'll go for a couple more here, Peter, before we invite Jane up. Um, should women in our churches be encouraged to lead Bible studies in mixed small groups? That might be a question, I guess, specific to different churches, as, as Jane's encouraged pastors to be working this out within... Uh, yeah, and I think I'm sure, I mean, Jane, I'll confirm that. I'm sure that's a question that's been addressed before. And again, it just depends what you see as, as, as your small groups. I know churches that do, I know churches that don't, and they're both kind of seeking to apply 1 Timothy 2. So that, that's something that, um, yeah, need, needs to be worked out. We do have a talk on the website, I've heard. Thank you. I, I actually be surprised what we don't have on the website, Jane. <laughs> it is rich. It is. Very it's very rich. Nice. I know. Peter's, Peter's agreeing with me. It's rich. There's a lot there. So d do go and look around. Uh, take, take your time, too. I mean, it's really good. Uh, this question is from Zanita. D does one another always mean everyone to everyone at all times, or can it mean everyone to some others as appropriate, especially perhaps with views towards submission to one another, Peter? Uh, I just missed the last bit, especially with views to... Submission, perhaps. Submission, submitting to one another. Yeah, I, obviously. I think, again, if we take that principle that Paul lays down in 1 Timothy, that, you know, even Timothy as a leader of a church is going to relate to older men in a different way than he's going to relate to, to younger men. Obviously, if, you know, I'm not going to seek to encourage a, you know, a teenager in my church in the same way that I'm going to uh, seek to encourage a contemporary. I think there's, there's wisdom. There's wisdom there in, in how we do it. So, yeah. Common, common sense wisdom, uh, recognizing, um, yeah, our uh, elders, you know, it's, it's not in, it's, it would be um, generally and usually inappropriate for a sort of, uh, you know, 18 year old King Christian to be rebuking harshly one of the leaders of the church in front of everyone. That, that, that's, you know, that's not appropriate. So there's, there's wisdom, you know, we need, we need to we need to work out what this looks like in practice in our context. And yeah, culturally, culturally, you know, you know the culturally, there might be differences as well. Yep. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I guess the principle remains that we're still responsible to one another. Yeah. And now it's the wisdom of how we love one another, yeah. how we speak to one another in an edifying way that's appropriate to who that one another, that, that other person is. That's yeah. very helpful. Yeah. And then the, the New, New Testament, Testament just gives us, in you know, very general terms, we just got to seek out how to, uh, how to apply it in, in our different contexts and not stress too much about you know what what are the kind of you know correct parameters I, I think it'll be obvious and natural in our context i might ja invite jane up for just a few minutes and, and we might have one or two more for you pete but you get catch your breath for a minute and have some water jane thank you um there have been a number of uh questions to you specifically um relating to uh your very helpful suggestions earlier one here is um, from Paul. For those of us who are not quite as knowledgeable about church history, any sh suggestions or shortcuts uh, that can help us find examples to share? Sure, yeah, I, I do love church history, but um, there's a number of excellent books that um, say, for example, you know, you're not reading, you don't have to read Calvin's Institutes to talk about John Calvin. So it might be that you look at something like Marcus Sloan's, you know, um, Masters of the English Reformation, so which looks at 
you know, has um, just, you know, chapters on five different men, for example. Or Claire Heath-White, she's got a series of three really popular level books that look at, um, one of them looks at women in the 16th century, one of them in the 17th century, and women in the 18th century. And they've got catchy titles like First, Wife Cl First Wives Clubs and other things like that. But they're just really accessible. So you, um, for you or for um, you know, a member of your congregation, they pick up that book and they can just read one short chapter and then um, from there hopefully get some other information as well. So Claire Heath-White, um, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Carl has um, some of her books, but they're available online. So different, there's a, there's a number of church history books like that. So I think that's your, your best way in. And then there's a lot of um, resources online as well. So some of the things, because they're, they don't have copyright on them anymore, um, there's available online, like some of the Puritan poetry, all the Puritan poetry of um, like Anne Bradstreet, for example, it's all online. So you can find out things. Yeah. That's great. And you've given even, um, you've even found books for adolescents. I mean, you've given books oh, yeah. to my children on... Yeah. Ten, ten women, uh, tw ten women you should know, or ten, yeah. ten men you should know, or different yeah, so folks. For, yeah, this. Um, so yeah, that's an excellent point. Thanks, Chase. So for children, um, there's. Um, I think I feel like there's more and more recent. There's just a plethora of church history things. So for really young, there's memory cards um, for church history figures, um, preschoolers, but also for tweens and teens as well. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Another question for you here, Jane. Uh, there's one here um, from someone that says, as a woman, they find it difficult um, to, I guess, express their gifts when maybe uh, their views differ from the men in charge in their church. Sure. How would you encourage a woman maybe where they have different views from the leadership in their own context? Yeah, so um, I think um, it would be really helpful if you're able to have conversation with the leadership in your church, um, and that could, be, that could go really well, that could be really quite tricky. But in the end, um, they're the leadership of your church. And so um, being willing to um, think, OK, well, we think differently on this issue, but these, um, this man, this, these men are the elders of the church and, and they're actually um, ultimately um, responsible under God for the direction of this church and being prepared for that. But it might be that in that conversation that you have with your staff member, with the elders, that there's other ways you can be expressing your gifts. But also because we have a gift or something, it doesn't mean that we have a right to exercise that gift. And it might be that there's a different context, say like not up the front in the Sunday service, it might be something else where you're able to express that gift. Um, I think a real danger just checking that you don't grow more and more bitter, that you can't express that gift, and being honest with yourself and with others, like um, potentially confessing your sins. Um, but yeah, just being honest with your minister about it as well, how it's difficult because you feel like there's um, say, for example, women's gifts are, are, are not visible um, in your church, whatever it might be, yeah. Helpful. Another question here for you, Jane. Um, I just had it up. I apologize. Uh, this is from Sandy Grant asking you, for the up-the-front slots, who should be involved in planning these and how might they be best prepared so that they're not last minute? Um, so thanks, Sandy. Um, so the Dean of the Cathedral could, um, yeah. So the, the example I gave before with the Tony Payne one and the book review, that was totally unprepared in the sense that I went out for breakfast before church to read that book. It's just a really short book. I said to my minister as I walked in um, that I just read the book, he goes, oh, great. That actually fits perfectly with the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> So that was fine asking me. I feel comfortable up the front, especially on that topic. It wasn't a sensitive topic, so I didn't feel like I needed, I wanted full scripts, so that's fine. So that can work well. Um, in the, in the, um, the church that I'm in um, now, um, so our assistant minister, Joss, is here today. So either Jocelyn or our pastor will um, regularly ask those who are doing um, prayers if they could also do a discipleship spot. So um, we... Um, and that's totally up to the person who's doing prayers what they're going to speak on. So I've spoken on quiet times um, in December. I spoke on Advent and other things. So one of those dangers is that um, not many people in some churches want to be on the prayer roster, But what, however you do that. Um, but in terms of the ones that fit closely with the sermons, um, then actually having um, looking at your preaching program and seeing potentially, oh, 
what, what might be a good fit with, you know, Matthew 5 or whatever it might be. When um, Mark Thompson and I, so when Mark often preaches in chapel here on a Friday and he will say to me, Jane, um, I think it would be good for you to do a slot on this passage and he gets me to look at the passage and come up with an idea or some ideas and we chat about it um, and um, I think of it um, potentially that this would be a good area for the college, um, for the students to think about more, um, for us as faculty to think about more. And some of it, sometimes though, it could be something that is not really that obvious in the passage. So one of them was um, that I can remember doing um, a little while back was the, the, the chapter that Mark was preaching on was a written prayer. So I did the place of written prayers in our Christian life in that um, for a number of the demographics of the students being younger, they don't necessarily use written prayers. So, yeah, it, does that make sense, Sandy? Did, yeah. That's helpful. Did you want, is that no, it? That's great. Oh, no, you can say. <laughs> Last question. This question will be for you and Pete as we conclude maybe before lunch. Uh, what are some of the blind spots that we might have, per perhaps from our culture that we live in, that keep us from faithfully loving and speaking to one another? Pete, go first. Jane says Pete, go first. I'm talking. This is my super <laughs> Pete, you're up first. I guess the problem with uh, blind spots is we, we don't know uh, what our blind spots are. But, you know, we, we've sort of already touched, touched on them. Um, you know, cultural expressions of authority of... Um, but, all, but also individualism where we become indifferent to others and we're just concentrating on ourselves. I think that's, that's the big one for me is the way that I'm wired. It's just so much about me and my relationship with God and maybe kind of caring for my immediate family. That, that's what I'm, I'm wired. And I've been really challenged by, you know, the, the words of, of Paul, you know, to, to be, see myself as sort of responsible to a degree, you know, and being anxious for, you know, the others in my church to, to, to strive to build them up and that I, I do have that wider responsibility. So that's how God's word has, I think, cut through something that was a blind spot for me. Maybe because you're, thickly Australian, Pete, now, um, and I'm still very American. I can see some things you don't see. Let me ask you, you can, this question. You can talk to me about it later, sure. How about, uh, how about the, the issue with, um, you know, cutting the tall poppies? So we often think that sarcasm is our love language here in Australia. Um, yeah. how, how does this maybe clash with gospel speech? Yeah, that's really helpful. And, you know, Calvin talks about, you know, the, the, the danger of, of sarcasm that you know you 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 make a sarcastic comment to someone who's having a bad day and it really does not have the 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 desired effect um but i think just the um you know what i was saying earlier about the the, the grumbling and complaining as well you know the way we relate to our leaders so often is just we just complain we just grumble and we don't sort of uh, thank and so over the last six months, I've just spoken to a lot of pastors and, and you know, almost universally, they would say their experience is that their, their congregation, the communication they get from their congregation is usually, you know, it's complaining. It's when people speak to them, it's, it's to, to raise an issue. Um, it's to raise something negative. It's very, uh, very infrequently to, to thank or to encourage. And I think that applies more widely than just a relationship with our, uh, with our leaders. It's with, with each other to be, you know, because grace is not natural, you know, grace is God's spirit working in us. Our natural easy inclination is to cr criticize and grumble. You know, we need to um, allow the spirit to apply the word to our own hearts so that we engage in much more positive uh, speech uh, to one another. And that's not being overly zealous or kind of being extreme. It's just the New Testament. That's helpful. Jane, is there anything you'd like to add on cultural blind spots? Yeah, I think a couple. So um, I think we, um, for some, of, it depends on your age, but um, some of us struggle potentially to learn from those much younger than us or think that we've got something to learn from someone much older than us. And so the one another commands um, from that aspect. Um, but I think a massive one and um, something I've been thinking about for a couple of years now, because I really struggle with it, is um, listening. And so are we actually prepared to listen and listen really well to people? Are we actually interested in getting to know them, understanding them, learning from them um, in, in one sense? 
them doing the one another commands to us, but actually then really understanding them, getting them, and so then we can love and serve them best. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I think listening is a really um, big critique for our for our culture. Um, for those of you who may be from a different sub, you know, different culture, maybe more Middle Eastern or something, you put a generally a higher priority on listening. Um, so maybe no, not so much a critique for you. But yeah. Thanks very much. Um, can we just say thanks to, to Peter and to Jane and Lucy for sharing?